I could invite you please to stand. going to begin by singing our entrance hymn in your orders of service, Amazing Grace. the sign of the cross together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Church of the Most Holy Redeemer this morning as we gather together to celebrate this Requiem Mass for John. I'd also like to welcome all of you who are not able to be here physically but are watching this Mass via our live stream and we think particularly of John's relatives in Australia. In this Mass we come together to do three things. Firstly we come to pray for John and to pray for the repose of his soul. 
Secondly we, secondly, we come to pray for and to support each other. And in particular, we pray today for all of John's family. We pray for his wife, Tanya, for his daughter, Isabella, for his mum and dad, Adele and John, who we will, please God, be reunited with in heaven. For his friends, Rosalind and George, Gloria and Joe, Albert and Jane, Ellie and Gary, Alan, and all of you who are gathered here, family, friends, fellow parishioners, who come today to mourn the loss of our brother. In this time of sadness, we give thanks to God for all that John gave to us in this life. And we ask that the Lord will protect and support him as he prepares to make the journey from this world to the next. I'm going to begin by blessing John's coffin with some holy water, a reminder to us of the day when he was baptized and he first received the promise of eternal life that he is preparing to take up today. The Lord God lives in his holy temple, yet he abides in our midst. Since in baptism John became God's temple and the Spirit of God lived in him, with reverence we now bless his mortal body. So going to place two symbols of our faith on John's coffin. The first item is the crucifix. Whenever we come into a Catholic church, we see the crucifix displayed. And when we see the crucifix, we see that Jesus himself died on the cross. But it was through his death that he rose again. And through his resurrection gave us that promise of new life after death. And so instead of being a symbol of despair, the cross is instead a promise of hope, that even in the face of death, God's love is greater than death. The other item I'm going to place is a Holy Bible, the Scriptures, and we believe that the Scriptures are good news because they tell us about God's abiding love, that even in the face of um, tragedy, uh, God's love is still with us and supporting us. And so we place this Bible as a sign of our hope and our belief in him, uh, that his love may be with us today. And so, dear friends, let us pray. Almighty God and Father, it is our certain faith that your Son, who died on the cross, was raised from the dead, the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. Grant that through this mystery, your servant John, who has gone to his rest in Christ, may share in the joy of his resurrection. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you now to take your seats as we listen to our first reading in your orders of service, which is going to be read by Tony. A reading from the first from the letter of St. Paul's to the Thessalonians. We want you to be quite certain, brothers, about those who have died to make sure that you do not grieve about them like the others who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and it will be the same for those who have died in Jesus. God will bring them with him. We can tell you this from the Lord's own teaching, that any of us who are left alive until the Lord's coming will not have any advantage over those who have died. At the trumpet of God, the voice of the archangel will call out the command and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died in Christ will be the first to rise and those of us who are still alive will be taken up into the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. 
so we shall stay with the Lord forever. With such thoughts as these, you should, be, you should comfort one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we remain seated now as we sing our responsorial psalm in your orders of service, The Lord's My Shepherd. Stand with me now as we greet the gospel, as we say together our gospel acclamation. with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God still and trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. If there were not, I should have told you. I am going now to prepare a place for you. And after I have gone and prepared you a place, 
I shall return to take you with me, so that where I am, you may be too. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. If you'd like to take your seats again for a few moments. There are only two occasions in the Gospels when Jesus is said to have cried. And one of those occasions was when he learned about the death of his friend Lazarus. But what we learn from the description that we hear in St. John's Gospel is that when Jesus comes to visit Lazarus' sister Martha, far from being grief-stricken, Jesus instead gives a ringing declaration of the importance of faith. I am the resurrection and the life, he says. If anyone believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. These words aren't only addressed to Martha, but they are also addressed to us today to console us in our loss of John. They tell us that death isn't the end, but only the beginning of new life. They tell us that death isn't a slipping away into nothing, but rather a recreation into eternal life with God. But most of all, these words of Jesus assure us that death marks a time when we are caught up in God's presence and when we are able to see God clearly for the very first time. In the face of death, the church has always believed and proclaimed that God creates each person for eternal life and that Jesus, through his own death and resurrection, has broken the chains of sin and death once and for all. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Now, of course, none of us know for certain what the life that will come after death will really be like. The scriptures sometimes speak about heaven as being like a meal or a banquet to which everyone is invited. We heard in our gospel Jesus describing heaven as being like a mansion with many rooms. Sometimes it's characterized as a paradise in which there will be no more tears or pain of any kind. While we may not know for certain what heaven is like, what we do know is that when someone has died, they still remain connected to us. Although through death we are currently separated from John, he still needs our prayers as he begins to make his way to join God our Father in heaven. As we heard in our first reading from St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that it will be the same for those who have died. God will bring them with him. With such thoughts as these, you should comfort one another. At this time of sorrow, we take strength from those beautiful words of Jesus that we've just heard in the gospel. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God still and trust in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And after I've gone and prepared you a place, I shall return to take you with me. The reason why these words are so powerful is because we know that these are not just empty promises. Jesus tells the disciples that although he will no longer be with them physically, he will do everything in his power to prepare a place for them in the world that is to come. It's been a great privilege for me to have known John for a number of years, starting when I was a student for the priesthood at St. Mary's in Hornchurch, and John was on the parish RCIA course, preparing to become a Catholic. More recently, John was coming to Mass here at the Most Holy Redeemer, and he still retained that curiosity and generosity which he had when I first met him. I always think of John as being like Thomas in the Gospel, saying, show us the way. The last time I saw John was when he came to the presbytery in order to give me a bottle of wine to thank me for visiting him when he was in hospital. It was typical John, thoughtful and warm-hearted, but neither of us had any idea that this was the last time we would see each other. 
Today, John is getting ready to prepare a place for us in heaven. And while we will leave this church in sadness, we take some comfort from the fact that one day, please God, we will see him again and see all of our loved ones in the new heavens and the new earth. Until that day, we should leave here confident in the knowledge that John is at peace, that he's not in any pain of any kind, and that after a period of purification, he will be able to enjoy eternal life with the Father who called him into this world and who is now calling him back. Go forth from this world, O Christian soul, in the love of God the Father who created you, in the mercy of Jesus Christ who redeemed you, in the power of the Holy Spirit who strengthened you. May the heavenly host sustain you and the company of heaven enfold you. And in communion with all of the faithful, may you dwell this day in peace. Amen. going to invite you to stand with me now as we bring our prayers before our Heavenly Father. And the response to each prayer is, hear our prayer. God, the Almighty Father, has raised Christ, his Son, from the dead. With confidence, we ask him to save his people, living and dead. We pray for John, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that he may now be admitted to the company of the saints. Lord, in your mercy hear our prayer. For our brother who believed in Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, that he may be raised up on the last day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all our deceased relatives and friends, and for all those who have helped us, that they may have the reward of their goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the family and the friends of our brother, that they may be consoled in their grief, by the Lord who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all of us assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered again in God's kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask for the intercession of Mary, our blessed mother, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. God, our shelter and our strength, you listen in love to the cry of your people. Hear the prayers we offer for our departed brother. Cleanse him and all the faithful departed of their sins, and grant him the fullness of redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we're going to take our seats again now as we sing our offertory hymn in your orders of service, Be Not Afraid. <laughs>
Pray, friends, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant John, we beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving saviour may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty, our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful, Lord, life is changed, not ended, and when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all of the hosts and the powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim, Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. If you'd like to kneel or to sit, join the Eucharistic prayer. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and you make them holy and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and the blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up in a similar way when supper was ended he took the chalice and giving you thanks he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying take this all of you and drink from it for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and his ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and the blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. 
May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all of the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, Alan, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant John, whom you have called today from this world to yourself. Grant that he who is united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. When from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all those who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages and praise you without end through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him. O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours, for ever and ever. Amen. So together we stand, as we say together that very special prayer Jesus our Saviour has given to us. At the Saviour's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to shake hands with each other or to offer another sign of peace as we exchange the sign of peace with each other. Say together, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. ask you please to take your seats as I explain to you about the distribution of Holy Communion. 
So in a few moments' time, I'm going to go down to the bottom step here, and we're going to start on this side of the church, starting from the front, and then when uh, people have received from this side, I'll then go over to the other side of the church, and again, we'll start from the front on that side of the church. If anyone isn't a member of the Catholic Church or isn't able to receive Holy Communion for any reason, you're very, very welcome to come up for a blessing. If you're not a Catholic and you would like to receive a blessing, please just put your arms across your shoulders to indicate that you would like to have a blessing. you to stand now for the prayer after communion. 
Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body food for the journey, mercifully grant that, strengthened by it, our brother John may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. So we're going to take our seats again now as we listen to some tributes from uh, John's family, and I'm going to invite James to uh, come up first. Although John was my godfather, he was more like an uncle to me. From giving me a teddy the moment I was born, to helping me navigate through the tough world of first-time jobs, he was always there when I needed guidance or support. In fact, it wasn't just me who he was there for, but for everyone. No matter how well he knew you, he'd always be there to give advice, a helping hand, or a shoulder to cry on, sometimes all three. <coughs> Now, in regards to who John was to my dad, he wasn't just a friend, he was a brother. <clears throat> From working together at BT to being old farts lounging in deck chairs together, John was always there for my dad through thick and thin, making the dull days funny and the long days short, and I know my dad will forever be grateful for that. <clears throat> to end this off, I just wanted to deliver a quote that encapsulates John as a person. <clears throat> Only a moment you stayed, but what an imprint your footprints have left on our hearts. Thank you. I'm going to invite Isabella now to come. To my best friend, the person who gave me light when all I saw was darkness. To the man who was the glue to the times I was crumbling. Today I'm speaking at an event that I never in my life dreamt would have happened so soon. A day I hardly ever thought about. I always knew this day would come, as I always remembered as a child I was so scared to lose you. And you were promised you were not going to go in anywhere. You were always going to be there. Still, then your time got cut too short, and that's what hurt the most, is that someone who had the greatest impact on my life, I will have longer to remember the memory of you than the time I spent with you. Thankfully, every night I replay those special memories, and even though they give me sadness that you're not here, which somehow I still can't give, comprehend, they give me warmth and joy. I honestly still believe that you are not here. The day I f lost you felt like one of the worst nightmares and a massive practical joke. Why didn't you wake up, Dad? It doesn't feel real. You could have just left me like that. You said you were going to be there when I was grown up. You promised me. And when I found you, I just wanted to wake up and say, Isabella, I'm joking. I'm always going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. Now, this isn't the time where I stand and talk about how I don't believe this is real and I can't understand how this happened so rapidly. But I want to talk about how when you were here, how you taught me so much and what a father you were to me. Ever since I was a little girl, you and I had a very close relationship. We were too similar for our own good, but you always told me how you prayed for a daughter like me. And every so often, you would tell me how you found out I was a girl and, I was, and when I was born, and you snatched me out of my mum's hands and had never felt so happy. He always told me, he whispered in my ear, how much you loved me already and how I was going to be your little girl. When I was roughly about five or six, my dad left us for six months to go to Australia to find work. Before you left, he taught me how to ride a bike, which he still went on about when I was 17. We used to live in Hornchurch, and there was a park behind our house. Every evening, we would go to the park and teach me how to ride it. Now, I can't say I got on a, on a bike and I was brilliant. 
I wasn't. I was terrible. I fell over, injured myself and cried. But every time that happened, my dad would pick me up, kiss it better and tell me to try again. And in the end, I would like to say I am a pro. Some beg to differ. Now, I wish I could tell you I did, I did this with everything, but I didn't. I very much used to give up on hobbies and difficult tasks very quickly until one of the most difficult challenges came into my life. When I was younger, my dad would be fixing stuff. Well, fixing is one word for it. Depend again on who you ask. But I was the daughter that would hand him the tools. If he was going for a drive, then so would as I. When he used to leave the house for work, I remember I would get back from school and wait at the stairs until he got home, because he used to play with, he, with me. I was, only, I was an only child and he used to get quite lonely and so was my dad. So he always used to understand why I got so bored and he would always try his best to help me. I mean, I had imaginary friends but it was quite hard to play hide and seek with them because, well, I couldn't see them. So my dad would play hide and seek with me or a board game or would watch a show. He was my best friend. Later on, we moved to Ingate Stone from Hornchurch. When I was younger, until recently, I struggled enormously with my mental health. I've had many downs before I nudged up. When the whole process started again, my dad was there. He knew what to do. He knew who to call. He knew how to calm me down. I may have not stuck with many things in my life and put a massive strain on our relationship, but I stuck with it and I got better. <laughs> That period of life still sometimes get me down, but I know I had to deal with it. Every time I fell hard to the floor, my dad was there to pick me up, kiss it better, and tell me to try again, which I, do I did until the falls became less frequent, and he did. So until I, get, I could get to the point where I fall, where I, when I fall, I can pick myself up. Just how he taught me and I, when I used to ride that bike, and I can try it again. Because every time you fail, fall, you get up stronger and you get used to the fall. I know I'm young and I shouldn't have gone through the stuff I went through. But the reason I made it to the other side was because of him. And he was right. We did go through it together. I just hope he's watching me now as I go through life, strong and independent, and I can pick myself up. He was there to see me able to finally ride that bike and I know that he will still be there watching me go through life. I promise to make him proud and that is a promise I intend to keep. He was a dad that every night he would come into my room and check I was safe and asleep. Say goodnight and tell much how much he loved me. He once scared me by doing this at the time. I wasn't that appreciative because he just completely ruined my sleep and scared the daylights out of me. However... I never really knew much how much comfort that gave me when it's gone, but I knew. But I know now. Then my dad was also. My dad was always obsessed with Alice in Wonderland. He used to love that movie and tried t many times to recreate. Do you mind my pronunciation? The Futterwacken. This was the Mad Hatter's dance. Even though he was the Mad Hatter, he was a terrible at the dance. When we moved to Ingate Stone, my dad got a projector that was also in 3D. The reason he got this was so he could watch Alice in Wonderland in better quality. I have to admit, this made the movie so much better. The reason I'm telling you this is because it's now my favourite movie for two reasons. One was that it brings back so much happy memories with him. We used to watch it on the sofa, Dad knowing every single word, yet we still enjoyed every moment of it and were still surprised by the events in the film like we had never watched it. The second was that how close Alice was to her father. She had so many qualities like him. She lost him at a young age, yet she still never forgot him. And throughout the movie, you can see their bond and how much she loved him and how he gave her the stability to her when she was younger. And I think my dad enjoyed that bit of the film as it resembled him of us two. So as I come to an end to this, I would like to say to the question of what kind of father you were. You were a fantastic father who raised me in one of the greatest ways. You have created an independent, confident, curious and imaginative girl, which are qualities I will hope I will never lose. 
Thank you so much, Dad. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who I haven't met for a while and won't be able to recognize me, I'm Tanya, and um, I'm fortunate to have been John's wife for nearly 35 years. I'm really, truly humbled to see so many, so many of you taking the time out of your busy schedules and traveling for a long distances to come and honor John today by attending the Thanksgiving of his life. So thank you. I met John in the winter of 1987 at the little then snowy Plovdiv airport in Bulgaria where he was on a skiing holiday and I was the oppressed ski rep. John rushed over to me telling me he'd lost his flight ticket, which he later back home found packed really neatly at the bottom of his suitcase. I reissued the ticket, he gave me his phone number and said he can bring me some duty-free perfume and cigarettes as he was coming back to Bulgaria for a seaside holiday in the summer. I didn't phone him, of course, but fate had it all planned for us. I was having dinner with friends at the hotel. John and his friends were staying. Um, they've just arrived, so John came and joined us. We met a few times during his holiday and had a great time at the beach and at the dinner, both with John and all his great crowd of friends, all of them who are here, still here today. I found John was never too serious and was really fun to be with. Cheeky sense of humor and always made me laugh. So all completely contrary to my expectations of an Englishman as I imagined an English, all English people all like to keep a stiff upper lip. He came back in October to see me, then in January again to bring the wedding papers and then after really meeting him three times in the course of less than a year, we got married in Bulgaria in April 1988. Three months after getting the coveted visa, I arrived in England as John's wife. I was so fortunate, as he always used to remind me, he had his own house, so we settled down well before long. His dad, a born and bred Englishman, joined the Merchant Navy during the Second World War and met his mum in one of the ship's stops in Perth, West Australia. They married when she was 19, his dad was 24, and then they settled in England in 1950, in the toughest period straight after the war. John never understood why they did this, as at this time Australia had no rationing and it was the land of plenty. John was born on the 27th of September 1951 in Gidea Park, a posh, a really posh suburb he liked to point out. His parents were keen to buy their own house though, which was not common in the 50s, so they moved to Plasto where they could afford to buy a house. John used to say often that's where he was dragged up, not brought up. The school John attended didn't have really fully qualified teachers, so there was not much focus on learning. The school was proud that they had one person who went to university. John followed his dad's footsteps, who worked for British Telecom. So he went to college and obtained um, a HND in telecommunications, and so he started his career as an engineer in telecoms. At the beginning of his career, John wanted to challenge himself and also earn some money to save for a car and a house. So he did, I don't know if you still call that, the knowledge, and qualified as a black cab driver. He loved driving and chatting to people, plus earning extra money working at the weekend. John worked for British Telecom, where he learned his craft, then applied it while working at UBS, an investment bank, but wanted to grow further in telecoms, so he joined Mercury Communications, which later became Cable and Wireless, which is now Vodafone. He worked as an engineer and later moved into the sales team as a sales support engineer. Committed to further bettering himself and learning, John did a Cisco 35 network professional course, which proved to be extremely useful to further his career. At Cable and Wireless, in the space of a few years, John 
won not once but twice the award as one of the top 50 sales support engineers. He was really proud of that, and rightly so. The reward each time was a great incentive trip with your partner. So we were spoiled um, and taken to the Seychelles and then to California. John then decided to improve his skills even further and did the Prince course to obtain his project manager certification and qualifications. This led to his consultancy project manager roles at TFL, Transport for London, for nearly seven years. The UK was heading into a recession with the global economy even weaker and stock markets falling. John decided to retire. He was 64. After 22 years of us enjoying life in Hornchurch, we moved to Ingatestone in 2014 as we believe there's better choice of good secondary schools here. As soon as we moved here, we both said, why didn't we do this much earlier? We really love the community spirit of the village, how open and welcoming people are. However, the best thing of all for John was that he discovered the only English blood relative he had in this country, a cousin, Tony, and his wife, Leslie, as all his other cousins are in Australia. Being an only child, he has always felt lonely and craved the big family. During the eight years we lived in Ingestone, John took to retired life in his usual manner, getting involved and just mucking in to help where he could. He joined the Parents' Association at Isabella's Primary School. He put himself forward as a governor of the school. He volunteered at the school fair, including doing the barbecue. Apparently, it was a job no one else wanted. He didn't know it was real hard work, flipping burgers nonstop for six to seven hours in the summer heat. He joined the local Catholic church, but also attended mass at the Church of England Church in Ingestone, supporting Isabella's primary Church of England School. In the last couple of years, he took great interest in the parish council, and it was in regular communication with the borough and county councillors. He wanted to get involved and to make a difference to the borough. John was very patriotic and loved Britain. John's lifelong ambition and hobby was learning Spanish. In the time before GPS and other tools we now have, I remember once we got lost driving in Palma in Mallorca, and as John was trying to practice and showing off, he stopped, we stopped to ask for directions. After a long conversation and gesticulations with a Mallorquian guy, I asked John, what did the guy say, and did he give you, what directions did he give you? John said, yes, he did, but I forgot the words in Spanish for left and right. <laughs> so he never gave up and went to gra grave lengths, joining two courses in lockdown, he even found some contacts online to practice his Spanish. John loved history, particularly the Second World War, and I used to joke that he had seen every single documentary ever made, but he did for sure know all the dates, all battles, all generals. John had a lot of all-around knowledge. He was great at quizzes, though he didn't have enough confidence, um, as he felt he was not well educated. John was definitely a people's person. He was completely gregarious, loved talking to people, everyone and anyone, especially on holiday. He loved chatting um, to people. That's why we always stayed in hotels, not apartments or villas. He was gregarious, warm and funny, and he had a lot of compassion. He would always get out of his way to help elderly, disabled people in every circumstance. He could be romantic, and would sometimes send me flowers at work on Valentine's Day, trying to embarrass me, or just bring me flowers at home. John was a family man. He didn't go to the pub, and must have been, because he actually preferred a lot more ice cream than beer. He didn't drink at all. He was really good at keeping in touch with friends and family in Australia. He strongly believed in education and installed in Isabella that a sold education was the ticket to stability independence and success in one's career in the current world. John was a great dad and a great husband, a competent, reliable and willing worker colleague. For the first 15 years of our married life, we really enjoyed life, traveled a lot in Europe, Australia, Asia, the USA. Um, but John had continuous health issues, including heart arrhythmia, 
thyroid asthma um, and now a heart attack. What I've always cherished about um, him that he never actually stopped me from traveling, both with work, on business, and um, on holiday. My favorite memory of John is back from our first date in Bulgaria when he bought me a chocolate box of milk tray chocolates and said, do you want me to show you which one is the best one? And when I said, yes, please, he pointed to the best one, quickly picked it up and ate it. <laughs> I was absolutely flabbergasted. Then he joked and he said, oh, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry, there's another layer. I felt sad, I feel sad for losing my husband and even more so my daughter's dad, but also most of all that it is John that's missing out as his life was cut short and is incomplete. There were many more holidays in front of us, movies and theatres, lunches and dinners, walks on the beach, which John will never have. I'm now pleased though that he's free of pain and comfortable. I hope that the place he's going to is bright and warm and carefree. And I hope they speak Australian and English. Sorry, Australian and Spanish. Thank you very much for coming. Well done, all of you. Not um, easy, but some very moving tributes there. We're going to stand together now for the final commendation. Before we go our separate ways, we take leave of our brother, John. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother John in the sure and the certain hope that together with all those who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon John in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn towards us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. So now in peace, let us take John to his place of rest as we sing our final hymn in your orders of service, Jerusalem. <laughs>